thank you and thanks for having me here today and I look forward to the conversation and I just wanted to put our perspective out there and explain what we're doing um, uh, welcome thoughts and challenges over whether we're doing enough whether we should be doing more but uh, bear with me I've scripted myself because I could talk about this as I'm sure we all could for ages and I'm trying to be respectful of your time I'm also a bit daunted that's my boss so having him watching me doing this is a little bit more. but to make a point about that being my boss um, he, uh, Steve Varley is the managing partner of EY in the UK and I, and he's the chairman of the UK firm. And uh, I report directly to him as the director of diversity and inclusiveness. And I'll mention it briefly, but that's one of the shifts we took. We moved DNI away from being part of the HR and talent function and put it in as one of the business imperatives. And that's one of the key drives, I think, of success. So um, back in 2013, um, EY established our first public targets around diversity and inclusiveness um, and we chose to set those rather than representation levels we chose to set those around the diversity of people entering our partnership we're a firm of chartered accountants and we're a partnership um, today if I'm honest five years down the line those targets look a little bit un unambitious in fact we're in the midst of a big um, review of our DNI strategy at the moment um, however they are that of the partners admitted to the partnership each year at least 30% will be female, and at least 10% will be from a black or minority ethnic background. So we, call, we refer to BME rather than BAME. Um, we think we were the first to set targets around ethnicity, and there was some internal debate at the time that we did. Um, but we have subsequently gone on to prioritise race alongside gender in all of our target setting and in all of our work. We have a commitment to not to talk about just gender, but to talk about race and gender together as equal priorities. For example, when we published our gender pay gap, which, as you know, is a mandatory requirement now, we published in full our ethnicity pay gap as well. Um, there are many reasons why we're committed to addressing the issue of improving the representation of BAME leaders in our organisation. Um, there's a couple of interesting observations of the power of us having done that. One is that when we were talking about gender um, on its own previously, prior to 2013, there was a lot of, yes, but that's just the way the world is. Um, the reason women don't appear in leadership roles is because of the motherhood penalty. Um, it's the choices they make or the choices, if, they're feeling pe if the pe speakers were feeling magnanimous, it's the choices that society forces them to make. It's not really much about who we are and what we do as an organisation. As soon as we started bringing ethnicity data into the equation and saying, well, actually, look, the same issues around pace and progression of careers for people from a black and minority ethnic background is similar to the disadvantage that we are starting to, are seeing in our data for women. It stops people in their tracks because the motherhood penalty can't be an explanation for that. It didn't actually stop our accountants in their tracks. The first thing they want to do is audit the data, clearly. <laughs> but once we've got over those hurdles, it makes people think, well, maybe it is something about me. Maybe it is something about us. We are, there are these hurdles in there and we get more focus on the conversations which benefits all of the characteristics of diversity. So I only have 10 minutes, I think, for um, let's cover a broad topic. So let me just say a couple of things. One is we do recognise that BME is a very broad category. And we do know that the, there are differences in the experiences of groups within that, those categories. We, for ease, we do refer to, we use the UK census categorisation. We use um, our BME population is all those who don't tick white anything or other. And that's the group we use. And for simplicity and for our data purposes, that's how we work. 84% um, of our people have shared their ethnicity data with us. So we collect data and we use it, and it's fairly robust. And that number has increased as we've um, been demonstrating why and how we're using the data. So... Firstly, just to set the context for this piece of our approach, I'm going to talk to you mainly about some of the, the how we do use data, but let me just sh show you that we're not about fixing the other. Our DNI strategy is on all about challenging and changing the organisation to be more inclusive. We have an extensive programme of training and awareness intervention, interventions on what we call inclusive leadership, which is the everyday behaviour our people show when they work with clients, when they build teams, and when they walk around the office as leaders, either leaders with a capital L because they've got positions of authority or leaders as visible role models and mentors with a smaller L. Um, we uh, talk about 
inclusion nudges in all of our processes. So where can we put in triggers that remind people that some processes and some assumptions that we've made historically have led to different, out different outcomes? And where do we need to build the most nudges in? And we do focus on talking and communicating and collaborating because this is not a zero-sum game. But also we try to build our brand around people, an organisation that does value diversity and inclusiveness an interesting conversation about brand with somebody outside but um, the reason for that is that we hopefully that we will attract people who have that same set of values that the diversity is important to them and inclusive behaviors are important to them I'll also say that there are some enablers to our strategy to just mention very briefly we have 26 employee networks we didn't start off intending to have 26 employee networks but we do very powerful uh, group I'm not gonna say very much about them we have 14 and a half thousand employees in the UK 11,000 of our employees are members of a network. Um, they're a really empowering part of our diversity work. Five of them are based around uh, cultural, um, ethnicity or cultural origins, and five of them um, are based around um, religion and faith, but there are other, and, and there are all sorts of other networks, but I know that Sharon and Joseph <coughs> are gonna be talking about networks. Um, we are a firm of accountants, and data is our language. So one of the powers of driving diversity and inclusiveness through the organisation is to talk the language. I know there is lots of objections about data, that it can be a delaying tactic, you can forever mine the um, well of data and uh, try and make it prove something different that you want to see. But with care, it can help you tell the story of what happens to people in your organisation. So we do rely on data a lot. Um, and as I said before, we shifted accountability for DNI to the business leaders rather than HR. So as part of their quarterly reporting, when they talk about their revenues, their client satisfaction scores, their people engagement scores, they talk about the diversity and inclusion metrics. So it's um, all of these pieces are enabling um, the the work, and they talk. We talk about um, gender and ethnicity. And those are the two metrics we report on. So. Uh, we also do offer targeted support for underrepresented groups. So having said we're trying to fix the organisation, um, we do offer um, a programme called Career Watch, which is a sponsorship programme. I think most of you know sponsorship is sort of this, uh, this elixir of um, active <coughs> career intervention in someone's career. Um, that is normally attracted to people um, who are the most familiar in the organisation. So we found that our white men were more likely to be sponsored onto the best opportunities, the best um, uh, networks, more likely to go out for lunch, more likely to someone say hello to them in the morning than our women and our particularly our BME. So we uh, interrupted that with a program of match sponsorship called Career Watch. Um, we also, rather contentiously, I was talking to someone last night who's recently graduated from it, have a leadership program called Future Leaders Programme, which is dedicated just for our BME senior manager talent. And um, we um, talk to our leaders, to, talk to our BME, we engage them with the problem. We just say, this is the challenges, we're, we're doing this. You know, what, we talk to them about all sorts of issues around about masking, about being authentic leaders. And um, most importantly, we talk to them about um, influencing allies and uh, other influencers. So although the programme is targeted at our FLP BME participants, there's a lot of leadership, senior leadership allies and influencers involved in the programme, and we change the hearts and minds and the race fluency of that group. Um, but we have used data to disrupt the business processes and the attitudes, and let me tell you a little bit more about that. So our data, we collect, um, we look at what happens, who we're recruiting by gender and ethnicity. We look at that by a number of other factors as well. Um, and we look at how those, how our people progress through the organisation. So we want to know who we promote each year, how the performance ratings are allocated, and we have something called resourcing, which is, I'm sure lawyers will know this, but we, um, well, most of you will know this, with people we take from uh, the pool and the jobs that we assign them to. And through our um, data picture, we know that in some parts of the business, it is not uniform, it, this is one of the challenges of it, um, it's not uniform, but overall, there, is a tenden there was a tendency, when we looked at this, particularly in 2013, for uh, women to get good middle ratings, so, so we have a five point rating scale, five high, one low, women are more likely to get threes and fours, our men were more likely to get 
t lower twos, but much more likely to get the fives than the women. Our BME population were more likely to get threes and more likely to get ones and twos, but less likely to get fours and fives. And um, we know that our resourcing uh, allocation of work, there were certain groups who were never always on the bench, as we call it. So you're more likely to get um, uh, given the plum jobs if you're in certain groups, usually white men. Um, interestingly, white men, BME women, then white women and then BME men. So there was lots of little things playing out which you could extrapolate up and give general messages for. We, we tend to give, tailor them to the particular part of the business. So we wanted to interrupt those and we taught the language of metrics, so we introduced a number of things. We introduced recruitment targets at every level. Um, actually, our recruitment targets were quite easy to meet. We don't really have a problem attracting the right diverse talent. Our problem was retaining it and progressing our diverse talent, um, a, a B, and BME talent particularly. Um, but our recruitment targets were, um, the, the, we then talked to all the recruiters, so the line managers, um, the recruitment team. We introduce um, inclusion nudges, so all the forms, every time, a lot of this is done electronically, <coughs> but every time you get a, um, an interview form, so this is your interview, this is the form you need to fill in, up pops a small weeble which um, talks about the fact that we've got recruitment targets and why. And um, on the form, there's something to reflect on afterwards. What, what happened? What was your uh, that shortlist like? What was your, um, uh, you know, what, what, what informed the decision from through an inclusion lens? So lots of prompts on it. We also get our recruitment providers in and run various workshops with them on why we've set in their con supplier contracts, diversity clauses and inclusion clauses. Um, we talk about preference requirement tradition to our people. You know, there's a lot tr in our sectors. There's a lot of we know what good looks like. Usually, we prefer it to look like the partners that have gone before. We traditionally, you have these ca capabilities. You know, no brown in town on your shoes. This is what you look like if you're traditionally a senior person in a financial services organisation. But actually, peel that away. What's the requirement of the job? And we talk a lot about um, what, what how recruitment looks different. Um, and as I said, these are built into our supplier contracts. What we need to do better is hold our suppliers to account, because the, the, we recruit, um, you know, we recruit um, a thousand graduates a year, but we recruit about two thousand employees a year. So keeping up with the bulk of that is, is one of the challenges of all of us in our busy busy lives. But most impactful, in my view, was our use of data to introduce a policy of proportional proportionality in both performance ratings and promotions. Now performance ratings, we've done away with performance ratings. We've moved to a new performance evaluation system which doesn't have ratings attached to it. So I could, that's another whole session. Um, <laughs> and I'll talk to you about that. But um, we still have a policy of, 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 of proportional promotions, which is not easy to say. So that means that um, we're a fairly, like a number of us, apprenticeship organisation. We bring in a thousand graduates a year, qualifying your professional exams, and we generally work up the ranks. Again, the future of work means we're, look, we're challenging the way we are shaped as an organisation. That's another whole topic of conversation, how we attract the talent of the future. But the current model is we generally promote, one every year we have a promotion cycle. And our pro <coughs> through the permission clauses, for those of you who are data aware, that we've included on when we collect data, we are able to provide the <coughs> committees who manage the, prom the promotion process with the ethnicity data of their employees, the employee group they're looking at. So they go through their normal round of promotion decision making. And then they'll press a button on this and they'll put it into a tool. They'll press a button and it'll say, um, you started off with a population that was 50% female and 30% BME. Of the pool, people that you're promoting, that now looks like you're promoting 40% women and 20% <coughs> BME, that's not proportional. And they, the, our policy is called comply or explain. So they're then given a series of nudges which says take that back from the data and look at what your, the choices you're making. Ask yourself why you're promoting those people. More importantly, why you're not promoting some other people. Look again at the conversation you had. There's an inclusiveness champion on every committee. Um, look again at why that, some of those people aren't being promoted. And this could be either way. could be white people who aren't being promoted, more likely to be BME people. Could be men, could be women. Again, it depends across the business. Look again at why not. 
Is it about the experiences they've had? We know that our resourcing is biased, so do, do you need to go and fix that at some point? Um, and really challenge the decisions that you've made around this. And then do you want to make any adjustments to it? It's a, not a quota, it's a complier explain. If not, then um, send it through. But your target is proportionality. If you've got 20% BME or 30% BME in your originating population, you need at least 30% BME in your promoted population. That has interrupted, disrupted is the word we use, people's thinking, because you've made the decisions, and, and now that the conversation starts at the beginning, okay, let's make sure we're looking at all of our talent, has everyone got, is every, have we got the right counsellors on our talent, our counsellors are our line managers, are people bringing the right skills to this conversation to represent all of our talent equally? We don't mandate compliance, but we do have this complier explain. Some parts of our business have become brilliant at explain, explaining. Lots of our business have become compliant. So we have increased our pipeline of BME talent. We've got 7% more senior managers who are BME than five years ago. They are much more likely to remain with us and to progress with us. And against our target of 10% partner admissions, this year 15% of our new partners are from a BME background. Our partnership has become more diverse. So now, at the moment, we're at 9% of our partners from a black and minority ethnic background. So, a whiz through our approach. Thank you.